health and functional medicine, we love to talk about the microbiome. And you've done some <laughs> compelling work that highlights this connection between the gut microbiome and thyroid health. And you've dubbed this term nutrient GI thyroid axis. Will you will you unpack that for us a little bit? Tell us what that connection looks like. Yeah. I mean, some of the, the broad strokes there are in those who do have Hashimoto's, Estimates vary, but it's between 20 to 40% of those individuals will have a deficiency of either intrinsic factor, HCL, or both. So they're at risk to be iron anemic or B vitamin, B12, not the only one, but they, they may be a number of B vitamin insufficient due to low ionization of the minerals and the vitamins. So that's one in, in terms of someone might be fatigued because of low ferritin or low B12. Maybe a lot of the people that we work with aren't because I'm assuming they're on multivitamins and B vitamins because they're just so proactive, but it's certainly something to be attentive to, especially depending on your population. Like our population is, they're just so well-read and, and so proactive that they're usually on a number of vitamins already. But that is one important factor. Another regards to thyroid conversion and autoimmunity, like we discussed earlier, vitamin D, selenium, and myoinositol. And those aren't necessarily broadly deficient, but they have been documented to help lower antibodies and improve conversion of, of T4 to T3. The other is iodine. There was one study, and I think this has been replicated by others, that found long-term adherence to a paleo diet actually did pose a risk of iodine insufficiency. So it's not something that I think is on the population level, but if someone's been on a restrictive diet for a long period of time, thinking about the paleo diet, cutting out some of the main foods that are fortified with iodine, which would be iodized salt, dairy, and grains, then inadvertently these people might be eating their way into iodine insufficiency. So it's just something to maybe have them use a iodized salt. And there, there's even, I believe, a iodized sea salt out there where you know the iodine has been added back. And then gastrointestinal absorption, right? The other thing that happens in some of these cases is they're not absorbing nutrients well. So wrapped in with the IBS, the SIBO, whatever it is, especially if it's chronic diarrheal type, they're just not able to extract adequate nutrition from their food. And that's where some of the, let's say, fatigue, depression, thinning hair and dry skin is coming from. It's not thyroid, but it's nutrient deficiency. You mentioned iodine, and I I think there's a lot of interest in this because so many, if you just, you know, go look at the thyroid support supplement blends, many of them will have iodine. And what we know is that perhaps that's not always appropriate for someone who has hypothyroidism. Will you talk us through a, your strategy for evaluating iodine? Are you testing this? Are you doing a dietary recall? How do we assess someone's iodine status? Yeah, you know, I used to look at this more closely with, if we could get it, a 24-hour urinary iodine. Some people don't do that because it's like carrying around a gallon of pee with you all day. <laughs> so sometimes it's easier said than done. But to be honest, I didn't see a whole lot of signal there. So what we'll do in some cases, especially if we're seeing a high TSH without any antibodies, and this wouldn't be a frankly high TSH, this would be like a subclinical hypothyroid, no antibodies, no family history of hypothyroidism. We're thinking, well, maybe the gland doesn't have enough substrate to produce the thyroid hormone. And we'll try something like a low dose iodine repletion. I have a little bit of tenuousness with you know the multi milligram doses of iodine, because as the audience probably knows, there is some evidence showing that high iodine intake can flare autoimmunity, but you also see problems with too low of intake. So the Goldilocks sort of principle here resonates, you know, anywhere, but you know, maybe you could do a gram to five of iodine per day, along with some selenium, if you suspect it. But in terms of working it up, you know, there might be something here that I'm missing, but it just never, at least from our purview, seemed to really move the needle. And again, there may have been something that we missed because we really turned our focus to where there was a much more consistent benefit to patients, which was their gut health. It is possible within our sampling, there was a subset who had problems with iodine that we just didn't fully pick out. So there may be something there that we've missed, but you know, those are my, my two cents. Yeah. The gut health seems to be pretty high yield. And my last question about it is let's say someone is, they're already on thyroid hormone replacement. They come to see you, you start doing some of this gut restoration. Do you, 
are you are you able to lower their dose or take them off their medication at some point once the gut health has been restored? Absolutely. Yeah. And for some people, actually, they will express signs of being over-medicated because their absorption improves. So definitely. And it's an important thing to just keep an eye on if someone does have frank gastrointestinal symptoms and they're on hormones. They may start having palpitations, insomnia, feeling hot, which could indicate that, you know, again, they're overly absorbed, or I guess they're correctly absorbing the thyroid hormone. And coming back to that meta-analysis, because this is a common patient question, well, what, I've been on hormone for five years, 10 years. Does that mean my gland is kind of wrecked and I can never get off of it? This study looked at these factors and length of time someone was on hormone did not predict their ability to come off. So it was really reassuring. But what did was at time of diagnosis, TPO levels and TSH levels. So that's something else you can do if, if you can get that data from before they started on hormone, what, what diagnosed them, then that can be used as a prognostic indicator if they'll be able to come off the thyroid hormone or not, or at least reduce their dose. Yeah. Wow. That's so fascinating. And I, I think many of us have been told once you measure TPO and it's positive once, you never have to measure it again. You know, many of us have been told that. What's your approach? Are you monitoring those TPO antibodies over time to make sure that they're coming down, knowing that they don't necessarily correlate with symptoms? We used to look at them much more closely, and now we'll only retest if they were above 500. Mm -hmm. Now, if they are above 500, you know, then we want to monitor that, right? Because again, I think a reasonable goal is trying to get them sub 500. And if they're not, then I mean, if someone wanted to repeat a TPO every six months to a year, especially if there's a family history, then maybe. It also depends on the person. Let's say you support their female hormones and a month later they go, wow, I'm sleeping better. My mood is better. Okay, I'll take the win, right? And I, I won't go into such fastidious monitoring if the person's doing really well. Yeah, that's a great, that makes great sense to me. What's the future of thyroid hormone research? I know that you'll you'll keep your eye on the frontier. What are you feeling excited about? What do you think will develop over the next few years in terms of our insight into thyroid function? Yeah, you know, what I found fascinating, we reviewed a study on this just recently. It's one of a few, but this one study in particular found that red light therapy on the thyroid gland led to a 400-point reduction of TPO. Now, for context, most of the studies looking at vitamin D, selenium, myonositol are averaging around a 200 point reduction. So pretty fascinating that a inexpensive red light, I mean, if you get a full body panel, that can be like one, two, three thousand dollars $3,000. But in this case, you only need something maybe the size of like a computer mouse to light therapy the thyroid gland. So that's pretty impressive. The study that I would love to see done is using any of these interventions that lower TPO, right? The photobiomodulation, the vitamin D, the selenium, the, the myonositol, and then seeing if that reduces the conversion to hypothyroid over time. Because we don't have that data. All we have is the studies that have shown the ability to lower the antibodies, which will probably correlate. But there are examples, as an example, uh, homocysteine with B vitamins doesn't seem to reduce cardiovascular events. So, you know, treating a marker doesn't always lead to the outcome that you want. So that's a study that I'd love to see published. But otherwise, in terms of thyroid care, the biggest thing that I think needs to be done is the functional medicine field to start updating some of the paradigm that we use, which I think, you know, again, coming back to that meta-analysis from the journal Thyroid, if one in three are on hormone that they don't need, then that's really disturbing patients. And it may be distracting from where the actual cause of their disease and dysfunction is coming from. So as a field, I think we've done so much to help patients with diet, nutritional support, lifestyle factors, and prevention of Hashimoto's. But where I think we're really missing the mark is being too quick, compassionately, but too quick nonetheless, to give people hormone and not making enough of a case before we do so. And if the solution is supporting gut restoration, repleting female hormones, reducing chronic inflammation, improving nutrient status. We are well suited to, to meet that. Yes. Need. Yes. Thankfully. Totally.